Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, we're going to talk about 5G with Technical Director Leland Brown from Intel. Leland, hey. welcome to the show. Hey, hey, Darren, I'll tell you. If, of, of all the people that I work with, you're one of my most favorite people to uh, talk to. Oh, Pleasure well, to be here. <laughs> all right. Wait, <laughs> kiss up to the show host. I'll ask softball <laughs> questions that way. That's the way to go, Leland. You got it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> no. So, Leland, you are our expert in 5G, in commute comms, 5G+, plus, all that stuff. You've been in the industry in telco, specifically in this forever, right? About 20 years almost now. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing when I think about it. Uh, my first job out of uh, out of school, uh, out of college, I went to Lehigh, was to work for the uh, U.S. Department of Defense. And the reason why they had recruited me is because well, while I was in, in college, I'm, I'm a car guy. Like, I love cars. I have like four cars outside. And I wanted to be an automotive electronics engineer, took up um, electronics at, uh, at uh, Lehigh. So my goal was to get into the automotive industry. And then at the end of the 90s, we saw a little little bit of a uh, downturn and Lehigh had offered these wireless courses. And I said, let me try try them out. So I tried it out and I developed a a, a white paper on how you can apply Bluetooth to the multiplexing within an automobile, meaning to, to to reduce the wiring harness sizes. And By some happenstance, the Department of Defense was looking at Bluetooth and they said, hey, this guy seems like he may be a person that we might want to bring in. So uh, the uh, Communications and Electronics Command out of uh, Fort Myers, New Jersey, they uh, contacted me. And my first job was working with the U.S. US, uh, Department of Defense, developing advanced wireless technologies for the uh, soldier. So that that was that was the beginning of of a very illustrious career. Yeah, it really started out working for the Department of Defense and trying to understand how they could take wireless technology. And I was working with a team called the Advanced Wireless Branch, and we were looking at cellular technology at the time, 2G, 3G. We were kind of in the middle of that transition point. Uh, Wireless LAN, they didn't call it Wi-Fi at the time, they called it wireless LAN, and this very nascent an immature technology that was called Bluetooth and how can we provide the soldier um, the ability to gather information within the battle space. And when you look now, it's the same as, but we, we could, we, we can go deeper into that. Um, I stayed with the department of defense for about three years. And the only reason why I left is uh, I really wanted to get my hands dirty. So I went, and started working with the contractors on some of our projects, like really putting my hands on. And my boss is like, we're not paying you for that. We're paying them to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I said, well, how can I, yeah, you, you, it's, you know, how can I learn? So um, from there, I decided maybe I need to go somewhere else to kind of gain more understanding about, you know, this, uh, this field. So that's when I started looking into the cellular industry. And I started working for Sprint around 2003, 2004. And from there, I stayed about 13 years in the wireless industry on the commercial side of the track, designing um, technologies or, I'm sorry, wireless networks, uh, starting at 3G all the way up to the end point of 4G around 2017, uh, right, uh, right before I came to uh, Intel to work on 5G. Well, I'm glad we grabbed yeah. you. I'm glad we yeah. got you at Intel. This is awesome. Hey, glad I'm here. So you you have the whole history around the TG uh, the 2G to 3G conversion because you were right in the middle of that. Right. And then three to four and now four to five and beyond. So give us a little history lesson on on those things. Yeah, sure. So, you know, depending upon the audience age, you know, early 90s, uh, very little cellular usage at the time if anything you may have seen someone that might have had what we call a back phone in their car and i mean i had a back phone um and that was like the greatest thing you know and the only thing you could hope for could i make a call 
I mean, and I'm saying literally a hope. If I pick this <laughs> thing up, is it going to make a call? And back then, it was you were talking about AMP technology, um, like 1G, maybe getting close to 2G. Now, key point, AMP started in the 80s. It was very specific. It was very expensive. The devices were huge. I mean, you used to call them brick phones at the time because the battery was so huge. But the goal was just to, to, to make a call. Literally, can you make a wireless call in the street while you're driving or, you know, in the in the area without ha- having to use what, what we call pay phones at the time? Um, from there, of course, every technology has its um, its its needs. You know, what is what is this goal? So what does the customer want? Well, 2G was really looking at, well, now can we start to transmit text? Uh, can we start to maybe bring some games into the phone? You know, what is the capability of the device itself? Can it do some very low rate data transmission? So 2G, like TDMA technologies, time division, multiple access, uh, GSM started to come into play, global systems mobile around and mid 90s time frame you started seeing companies like sprint to come into fruition uh they brought out i think they started out on gsm then they went to tdma and possibly cdma uh, but this is when you started seeing maybe more of a broad usage of cell phones up to about the early 2000s and this is when you started to see a transition to well i have a phone that can make calls, maybe send some text but what about me being able to use the internet you know the internet at the same time is starting to become more of a common, uh, you know, platform for people to use or technology, right? And we started to see, you know, um, laptops, you know, more prominently connected to the internet as compared to being the standalone system. Well, people started to have the same expectation for their phones. And what I like to always equate this to, I don't know if you remember PDAs, personal digital. Oh, yeah, yeah, business, I remember. Business. Yeah. So I remember I was sitting at a at dinner with this guy, at, you know, that they should work for at Sprint. I said, hey, what if we took this phone and we took this PDA and we just combine them together? And I think that that'll be cool. And I remember my boss said, who will want to work on that little screen? <laughs> who want to do that, man? And I told him, I said, me? And, yeah, me, everybody, right? So I, I told him, I said, in 10 years, man, I'm going to come back and I'm going to bet you. And I want you to pay me my money because I promise you this, that this is going to happen. I had no clue, but I felt that this is where the industry, you know, was was really going to go. Well, yeah. you get into 3G and, you know, the iPhone comes out. There's there's, there's some other, you know, um, uh, you know, smartphones or um, devices that had the same type of form factor that, you know, that came out at the same time. But they really weren't smartphones. In any case, 3G brought your very nominal broadband capabilities right you know you were able to do some internet but it was probably more frustrating to actually do internet but the primary thing was you can now tra- transmit pictures and the like so it was the goal you know every generation had goals and 3g was the first time you heard the term g before then they, we, we didn't right. call it 2, 2g 3g was the first time you heard it. it was 3g okay third generation i think it was some, 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 some type of mem- uh, magazine or something somebody said 3g and it just stuck and this is when you saw 3GPP, that standards body started to come into play. Um, and then we drove to, what, 2008? I was working for Sprint, and I moved over to a company called Metro PCS. And we were looking at deployment of infrastructure that wasn't based on large large cell towers. Now we were looking at this more of a, a, of a, of a uh, distributed system, meaning having our baseband units sitting inside of a hub somewhere having our antennas front hauled via fiber to telephone poles and the like. And that's when you started to see a transition from 3G to 4G, true broadband. You have to give credit where credit is due. 4G provided broadband in hand, right? And it enabled companies like Amazon, wouldn't exist without right. 4G. Netflix wouldn't exist without 4G, or it would stay in the state of. But I think they were like a mail service for 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 for, for uh, DVDs. Um, a lot of our platforms that we use today, without 4G, they would have never turned into what they are now. 
So I give I have a tendency to give credit to the economic boom of the of, from 2010 to 2020, if you will, to 4G, because it put broadband and access to these different capabilities into the hands of the uh, consumer, the endpoint. Then we get to 5G. What is the goal of 5G? Well, we have broadband in hand, but everything's not connected, right? We don't necessarily have defined services. Everybody has broadband. If, if, I'm, if I was to design a cell tower, I'll just, you know, uh, deploy for frequencies and coverage in the area. And hey, if you're able to gain access to that service through your phone, you have it. You know, if you're f- 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 further off, depending upon the coverage or the or the or the uh, capacity of the uh, network. You know, you, you have access to it, but it wasn't really a defined service set where you can say, hey, this device gets this amount of broadband or bandwidth and this device deserves this, this type or whatever service requirements it would need. Augmented with the fact that now your infrastructure is transforming from something that's very monolithic and where, where the carriers are considered in what, what they tend to, tend to call RAN jail, <laughs> where they're connected to this RAN developer for a very long time, okay? They, they, they've invested heavily into them. And the only time that they can really look to move forward is unless they change generations. So a lot of that was, hey, we want to move to another generation. Maybe you're not the character, the, the, vendor, the, 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 the uh, vendor of choice. Well, now you're, you're getting into where 5G provides these open RAN um, architectures where it's open source. Your baseband is software defined. You can now develop software stacks that can be integrated into that whole software solution. And it opens up the field, okay, where you're not tied to this monolithic architecture. You can now take this and provide services. You can provide standalone private networks. You can really pretty much build your own cellular network in a way. That, that's really interesting, Leland, because I always thought, oh, 5G is just going to give me more bandwidth. Um, lower latency, and that was it. That's all I was getting. But what you're telling me, it also gives flexibility to offer new types of services where things aren't hard coded like they have been in the past, right? Well, massive flexibility. Ma- yeah. So, so what that means is, I could start looking for maybe some new types of services that the telcos are going to start providing that maybe they never thought of providing before. Is that what I'm so- hearing? Yeah, it, so true. You know, services from the from the uh, telcos and the carriers can be enhanced, and they can bring in uh, you know various kick, various capabilities that they necessarily didn't focus on providing before. Also, while uh, bringing the ability to have access to the platform to to, to an edge, I always say now what you're seeing is with edge compute or I'm sorry compute you now have a requirement to bring that compute as close as possible or that platform as close as possible to the, to, to, to the, to the uh, endpoint where the user has access. When you talk about latency reduction, it's really about reducing that path and then going all the way back to the cloud and out, that's a long circle. That's a long round time. If you can push that to the edge for now, the user has access. And, you know, I know Anna Scott was on your show a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. She more than likely spoke to this, that edge, the driving that edge to the, to the uh, endpoint of the uh, user is extremely important. Well, that level of flexibility 5G provides you. So, ability- so do you think 5G will last as long as 4G did a decade? Because, I mean, 4G has been dominant for a decade. And like you said, unleashed, unleashed um, e-commerce and a ton, I mean, tons of things. Do you see the same thing happening with 5G or do you see 5G as an interim, as a, as a stop gap for 6G or whatever comes up next? I honestly see that's, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. I honestly see a movement away from the G. Oh, interesting. And I say this because it made sense when you wanted to uh, provide some level of emphasis on the commercial track to say, hey, we now are a 4G network. We are now a 5G network. Um, But when you're getting to a a, a situation now where it's really about the capability of the the, uh, network and now you're taking down these these, uh, partitions, if you will, in terms of who can deploy networks 
to say a G doesn't necessarily give it enough credit, meaning the uh, technology enough credit to continue to evolve continuously. There's no real partition anymore, right? Now, the development of this technology is broad and the use cases are broad. They're even flowing over into federal uh, use cases. If you want to hear more of my interview with Leland, tune into my next episode where I talk to Leland about 5G and defense. Thank you for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you enjoyed our podcast, give it five stars on your favorite podcasting site or YouTube channel. You can find out more information about Embracing Digital Transformation at embracingdigital.org. Until next time, go out and do something wonderful.